Harold Siegel Cole. I was, I've lived in Cornac here since 1943. Uh, I was born in Weyburn, Saskatchewan. I was born in March 1927. I grew up at Constance and then here. I've been in this, I've been in the area all my life. My name is Cecil Keast. I was born in this area. Cornac wasn't here then, but it was this area, it was a municipality, and uh, I was born 19th of November, 1921. Other than a five or six year hitch in the army during the war, other than that, I have been in this area all of my life. Oh, I don't know of anybody else that's still living that uh worked in the underground mines around here and there was a number of mines but as far as I know they're all passed on. There was a mine here right in, in Cornac right in town that, that they didn't mine under the town but they mined out from the town and uh, I worked for a year for Joe Brandeis and he had the mine well, he wanted to sell the mine because he bought the hotel, and uh, so I bought it, and I operated the mine for 1946 and 47. And uh, that's when I worked underground there. I worked underground in the mines in B.C., but uh, that's my mining experience here is in the, in the mine here in Cornac. Coal has been a necessity. There's no trees in this area when the, the homesteaders came in. And uh, so what are you going to burn for heat? Oil wasn't common in those days. But there was coal. It seems like under nearly every hill, all you had to do was dig in a ways and you would, you would get some coal. There was Quite a few mines developed along the muddy up here and, and uh, some east of town. And there was some strip mines west of town. My name is Cheryl Jaroje. I was born in 1956, about 15 miles uh, east of Cornac. We uh, had a small farm um, beside a butte and on that butte our dad had a coal mine. Well, you're at the... Uh, entrance to the old Benny Berg coal mine. He uh, he had this mine in the 40s, and I guess maybe the early 50s would be the last uh, that it was mined. You can see uh, that depression in the hill up there. That would be the entrance into the mine. The track would came out to where this post is in the ground here. I remember seeing the entrance to the mine. We would go up there, and we uh, the tracks were still there. We could look into it. Dad wouldn't let us into the mine unless we'd get into the car to go down, and he'd show us some things, all the little rooms and that. And we'd come out kind of dirty, riding in that coal car. My sister and I, we would walk those hills and around the curve from that mine also was another mine that our uncle had previous to that and from what I know those two mines intercepted and on the top of the hill was an air shaft and when we were growing up that air shaft was still open so we were specifically told to stay away from that air shaft. And inside the coal mine the the, the feeling was different. It was an eerie feeling. The, it, you, you're dripping and cracking. I don't know that we were afraid of it, but um, we were just told not to play around there. There had been a collapse in the mine and uh, uh, the cutter, all of dad's things were are probably still in the mine. Uh, the mine had collapsed and he just walked away from it. Some people can't go underground, but uh, 
I never had a problem working underground. We were often afraid for for my dad because he could could have got covered up. We were very poor. Um, to me, there was no signs that coal ever really was a very lucrative business for my dad. Dad was a coal miner, and we were happy that he had a job, I think, and he made a good living for us, as good as everybody else. Everybody was poor at that time. I know when I was growing up in the 30s, the mines were all operating, and I, my dad would bring home a load of coal, and we'd put in maybe anywhere from 12 to 20 tons in the cellar to do this for the winter, because they did burn a lot of coal. The houses were not insulated like they are today, and the windows weren't as good, and so it took a lot of heat and a lot of coal, a lot of ashes. <laughs> smell was something else. I can always remember the smell of coal. You could taste it in your mouth, even. Bring home just whatever you can handle. And that's kind of the size that will flow through the bottoms of the trucks and stuff when they bring it out of the mine. I, I use this old cook stove that was my mother's in here when I when I can to help keep the heat from being too heat, heat bill from being too high. And uh, we burn wood in it and. Uh, as you know, there's not a lot of trees here, so we use coal when we can, and it's available at the mine here, so we still burn some coal. We had a coal stove in the corner of the kitchen, so in the winter time when it got really, really cold, Dad would still fire up this stove for additional heat in our home. I think power came in 1955, the year I was born, so I don't remember it in common use, but it was in the basement, and when the power went out, we used it. We cooked on a cook stove that had about four round circles of lids and it had a lifter that fit into the lid and a hole in the lid and there was a warming oven at the end of the stove where it kept our water hot. So to get coal burning you can't just put it in and light it up. You have to start your, your fire with, with wood and I, I started with a wood fire here. And then when I add my coal, it'll take off. There was pipes all across the, the, the room. And sometimes when the fire, when we banked it at night, then we bank it with more coal and shut it down. And uh, it would keep pretty well warm all night. But sometimes if the wind came up, the uh, air would pull the fire alive. And uh, you'd look up and see the chimney or the stovepipes starting to redden. Wonder the houses didn't burn down then. Very well, all the mines in this area closed down in the late 40s and uh, around 1950, 51. There was, a, there was a spell from the 1950s to the 1970s where there was no demand for coal. From the 1970s until now, coal has been a, important. I was talking in the middle 70s and I was already farming um, and I, we knew there was something coming. There was a lot of seismic activity so it was going to be either oil or something they were looking for and we eventually found out there would be a coal project and a, and a power plant. I grew up on the farm here and it would be a third generation farm when I started growing up on it and uh, loved the cattle and the land and the crops and uh, just country boys. We explored all the the country knew every nook and cranny of the land. We would either ridden horses on it or rode dirt bikes on it. Originally, SAS Power ran the mine and the power plant, so this would have been all up to them. And so we, I remember going to these public meetings and uh, looking at the big map on the wall and realizing our farm is in that mine project. Well, it was kind of a shock because you don't think about changing your location or moving your location if your farm it's always been a long long term thing i think everybody was apprehensive because uh the first thing you know is that when there's going to be a strip mine project it's it's either going to be we're going to live on the land or they're going to mine the land so we can't both be here 
And I think everybody realized that if there's a, a large strip mining project, it's going to displace a lot of farmers. The Surface Rights Organization was set up as a result of the government attempting to buy a considerable amount of farmland in this area and uh, buying it from the individuals. They were much in a much better position to deal if they were a group rather than individuals. This appears to have been very, very successful. Um, their corporation was set up over 40 years ago, is still operating uh, and still serving the same purpose. When this, uh, this project was announced first, uh, our local people in, in this area thought they would go down to Estevan and have a look, see what happened down there, because they knew that Estevan had been involved with the, with the very sort of thing that we were running into. They find there's dirt piles 20 or 30 feet high being left on the land, which really makes it of no value at all for farming. And so that was one of their main concerns of, they didn't want to see that happen here. It would wipe out the area actually. Lots of, lots of stress lots of sleepless nights. And as we've been 20, 30, 40 years down the road, we see people who've gone through it, they've gone on with life, they're okay. But those first guys didn't know what was gonna to happen to them. And I think probably we saw people suffered. The amount of money being offered to these farmers in the first place was the kind of, of money that would, be, would have been paid if you sold your farm to the neighbor. But when it's being sold for commercial production, like for the production of coal for the power plant, uh, that's quite different. So we realized it had to happen and we approached it as uh, this is going to happen and it's an essential thing and it's good for jobs in the community and it's good for uh, people need the power. So we, we saw it with some sort of uh, adventure as well. I were married in 1973 and um, he was a uh, heavy duty mechanic. Uh, he had worked in Regina and Weyburn and we got married and we um, thought we would start out our married life here in Cornac, but we weren't doing very well. We were looking at Medicine Hat. We were thinking of making moves. Um, and then the, there was the big announcement that um, a coal mine was coming to Cornac, a power plant, and uh, in 1979, Glenn joint, went to work at the mine. So that was a huge, huge um, happening in our lives. Um, and what it has meant is our, is, um, well, what it meant was making a living. And which has been making a living for us for, well, Glenn's been at the mine 38 years this year. I came here in uh, 1978 and started work at the coal mine. I, I, I worked construction, building the power plant and the original mine, which was west of town. And uh, in 1985, uh, I ended up being employed by the coal company here and worked for them for the remaining 28 years of my career. I think the mine and the plant really put some life back into this area. Coal uh, carried the farmers and the settlers here for a number of years, but then when uh, in the 70s when the power plant was built here and it was built here because it was coal here uh, and the mine opened um, it transformed Cornac from a small village in the middle of nowhere to uh, a fairly substantial community. It was exciting the town was uh, maybe 350 people when this was announced so we were here for 
all the excitement, the construction, the um, the it was exciting to see the housing starts in town, the sportsplex came, the swimming pool, um, a few businesses sprung up. Without coal, we would not be where we are today. Our kids were able to go to school here. I doubt that with this, if this project had not happened, I don't know if, if um, how much longer Cornac or maybe even a lot of small towns around here would have survived. We've recognized in this community, the power plant and the mine employ probably 300 families, 300 people. And it's kept a school, it's kept a rink, and it's kept stores. And uh, so the industry has been good for the community, the jobs. Um, we're all glad to turn on our thermostat and plug in our vehicles and use the power. And we've worked out equitable ways to deal with the, with the disruption that it causes with farming. And, and we're all here. just about 50 miles north of Cornac. We're down in the pit at the coal mine, one of the two pits, where the loaders lo actually loaded coal to get shipped to the power plant. We mine 3.5 million tons a year we sell to South Power. And it's a lignite coal, and it's a strip mine that's not underground like it was in the past. We mine with drag lines and strips, and the drag lines actually don't touch the coal, they just take the overburden off the coal and trucks and shovels and loaders take the coal out of the pits. Montgomery. I'm from Willowbunch. We're at Sass Power, Poplar River today. Um, I've been here for 11 years and I'm a coal handler. I'm Scott Kirby, uh, born Cornac. We farm just outside of town. Uh, I've been here since 98 and I'm a coal handler too. We're a, a coal-fired uh, power station. We produce uh, on, at any given time about 630 megawatts of power. Uh, we have two, two coal-fired units, uh, each 315 uh, megawatts. And basically at any given time, we're producing about anywhere from 19 to 20 percent of power being consumed in the province. At Cornac here for the last, well, it's nearly, probably over 10 years now, we've had at the ECRF building or the Emissions Control Research Facility, uh, where we test for uh, we do stuff like mercury recovery and, and just sampling on the on the fly ash and the, and the particulate. I find the work here in 
in the research facility extremely interesting because it's new, it's cutting edge. I started here in 2004 and our first, uh, the first phase of the test facility was for uh, studying uh, the ability to detect and remove mercury from the flue gas that uh, that uh, most lignite coal power plants all have mercury emissions. So SAS Power, with some recently imposed restrictions on on uh, uh, emissions, uh, decided to put the test facility in place uh, to test to see if we could control or reduce our mercury emissions. Is, uh, attracting employees and, and retaining them, we, we've, you know, we've found our best. Uh, the best way to do that is to hire local people because they want to stay. They're used to a small town, um, and they, you know, it's, it works out good for us because they, they're from this area, so they, you know, they want the place to do well. They take a lot of ownership and, and pride in, in working at, at, at Poplar River. Lots of friends actually out of high school started in this plant that have moved on to the line crew or Esteban or Saskatoon. But for me, I guess I'm still in Cornac because of, of the ranch. Like, um, if, it, if I wasn't tied down to the, our ranch and that's what my passion is, I guess, I probably wouldn't be in Cornac either. But um, this plant and the mine of have held a lot of people, not held, but kept a lot of people in this area, not just Cornac, but you got Willowbunch, Bengoff, Assiniboia, Rockland, and a lot are tied directly or indirectly to the mine and the plant. Most of us that started in, I'm going to say around the time I started, the early 80s, it, farming, we, most of us all farmed, and some still do, but farming really wasn't good, so we thought, well, we'll just start at the mine. We all, everybody wants to run equipment, and it's just become a lifelong, it was a dream and a lifelong experience that most of us, most all of us have just thoroughly enjoyed. It's been great. Uh, my name is Parker Beauchene. Uh, I'm a loader operator here at uh, Hopper River Mine. I run the Cat 993 that's sitting behind me here been here for four years now uh, from Willowbunch. Uh, I got a family farm there. It's been in the family for over 100 years. So the, with the 12 hour days and the shift work, it gives me lots of opportunity to, to help out there. Been at the mine here for 31 years now. And I'm proud of the fact that I've been at one job that long. It's it's a great job, it, uh, great guys to work with. It's great for the, for the local economy like uh, Cornac itself has uh, 700 people live in the town. Between the mine and the power plant, that's all coal industry. We have, well, sure, we have our agriculture as well, but the town wouldn't be the size it is if it didn't have coal. I've been at the mine for going on 33 years. Uh, I've been drag mine operator for about 20 or so. And uh, my family farm was bought up by this, like, by the mining company. And uh, yeah, I mean, They've been a great industry for our community. I'm Bryce Rolson. I'm from Cornac, Saskatchewan. Been here all my life. Uh, working the dragline as a dragline boiler. Where I grew up, uh, we basically the the mine took the block of land where we uh, where I grew up, and uh, it's all mine now. It's slowly being reclaimed, I notice, and uh, I guess it's progress, right? <laughs> You can see we've got two D10 dozers that are reclaiming this land back to a farmable state. They'll take it down to a 10% slope, so it's, uh, and then we'll re-cover re, uh, soil it after. So the first step in the, in the coal mining process is removing the cover soil. Uh, we call it cover soil, it's really just the top 20 centimeters of topsoil. Um, anything that's really great for growing in is what we save. So before we do any other things uh, on the mine site, we make sure to save that the very valuable topsoil. Um, we put it either in stockpiles or we direct place it on other areas of the mine site. Um, but that's the very first step. Um, then once the, the drag lines expose the coal and the coal is mined out, then we get to the next process in, in the reclamation. So what you're really doing is you're, you're taking the, the material that was once on top of the coal and you're pushing it back into the hole. The topsoil is actually placed out in a nice even thickness 
which is sometimes better than the way Mother Nature puts it on there. Um, so it gives us a really nice, great uh, growing material or medium, so that we're able to revegetate it. A lot of areas that we've we've mined through. There was a lot of hilly areas, and, and of course back then it was half and half farming. So there was an awful lot of erosion, and and we stripped the cover soil off prior to stripping with the drag lines. And on the hilltops, there's basically maybe an inch of that. In the bottoms, you could get up to four feet. So we mine through and level all the land out and lay the cover soil all back on. It's eight inches even everywhere where we've mined. So it's laid on and it's monitored really closely. We're, we're very proud of our reclamation. I don't think there's anybody does as good a job. I'd like to see it if they do. Uh, I love the drag line. I mean, it's just like a home. I've been here quite a few years and I kind of know the old girl a little bit. And, uh, uh, yeah, and I mean, the people are good to work with. Uh, you know, I've got a good oiler to work with and the guys are good. So it makes my job easier when the guys, you know, all do their job and like, we all work together as a team. The environment is, is really great to work in. Um, Everybody is always very friendly and very helpful and um, it's just a, I was just drawn to it immediately. So that's kind of why I was very happy that this position opened up when I graduated. I just think it's a really good place to work. The fellowship with the men, watching young people come up now through the through the ranks, learning equipment and different job techniques, which we did 30 some years ago. It's just, it's rather interesting and hopefully we can pass on to them things we did to, so they don't have to relive some of the mistakes we made, but just make them better at what they do. I grew up in, uh, on a ranch, just uh, northeast of Big Beaver. So I'm a, a local, local guy here. I, I guess when I had left high school, uh, a friend of mine that was working here gave me a tour of the plant. Uh, at the time, late 80s, early 90s, agriculture wasn't doing so well, so I went to uh, Medicine Hat College and uh, took some power engineering classes and then come back to back to work here at Poplar River. I didn't really know much about it even though I grew up in the community. So I applied and got on and I started in utility crew and moved into coal handling and it's been a good fit for me for, uh, for farming. I was born and raised on a farm and uh, actually just uh, came to, uh, this is my 31st year with SAS Power and I just, uh, I had nothing to do with coal before the day I walked in the power plant my first day of work. Nothing at all my relatives had. It, um, I'm local, I'm from the area and there's lots of coal mines in the area. I had I had a lot of I had a few uncles three or four that actually worked in some of the old coal mines in this area, mainly around Willowbunch. And my dad worked out here for a good 25 years uh, as a contractor for SAS Power, so I got ties here too. So what we enjoy about working out at the plant here and producing power is, you know, that it is a, it's an important job. Uh, people a lot of people don't realize that, you know, they they just take electricity for granted. Uh, we don't see a lot of the stuff behind the scenes where, you know, there's guys working out here 18, 20 hours in the middle of the night, you know, trying to get uh, the unit back on and produce power. So, you know, we always try to keep that focus, you know, that we know that, you know, somewhere somebody is, you know, relying on us to, to keep the lights on. The burning question on, on everybody's mind. Uh, unfortunately, we don't, you know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but you know, if you take as you, you know, if you take 150 jobs out of you know, Cornac that work at SAS Power, and you know, a typically about another 150 or so from the mine. You know, it's not only Cornac; it would be a, be a huge impact on all the surrounding areas as well. Coal has supported the community in, in one way or another since the homestead days, except for a little gap in, in between the 50s and the 70s. I think it would have been a complete disaster, or it would be even now, if this project was shut down. Coal is no longer utilized, will be uh, as Helps it as big an impact as what finding coal here and, and utilizing it has been over the last number of years. So, uh, yeah, uh, 
Karnak is a cold town, no matter what way you look at it. The town wouldn't be the size it is if it didn't have coal. And uh, the things I've done through the years, like like become involved in the community. Uh, I've most recently uh, been elected to town council, but through minor hockey, through refing hockey, through coaching my kids in hockey, baseball, you know, uh, it's a great community to grow up in. If it ever were to go by the wayside, like if, if we were to lose our coal industry, I don't know what would happen to the town. I really don't. You know, it's tough to think about. I think there's lots of families in Cornac, just like myself, who, if the mine and the power plant weren't here, um, we would have to relocate to find other sources of, of income. The comfortable lifestyles that we all live now in Cornac uh, go back to the source of coal in the community, and it will be sad when that is no longer there uh, unfortunately, places like Cornac uh, don't have a lot to offer as alternative industry and jobs, and so uh, we will inevit inevitably revert back to the small villages that it once was. And with the agricultural community shrinking in, in actual numbers uh, of people involved with the larger farms and the modern equipment, uh, Cornac may well go back to being a community of a hundred people uh, as opposed to what we have today and what we were at our peak. So yeah, there, there will be a huge impact and uh, I'm not sure that everybody uh, has totally allowed that to sink in and, and taken the realization of where will I be? 15, 20 years from now. Pretty tough lot. Um, it would be really, really bad if coal wasn't in Cornac, but we always seem to survive. It just, there wouldn't be a lot of a community, but what would be here would be a bunch of tough people that stuck it out. This project coming in here uh, made the big difference in whether this place remained or disappeared. Um, Generally speaking, the small towns all around on this line have disappeared completely. Coal has been all about making a living. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. It was uh, making a living for my dad. Um, uh, and it's been how we have made our life. Yeah, all of it has revolved around my husband working at a coal mine. They say they're going to be coal free by 2030. And uh, I don't know, it seems to me that there has to be some way to take the sulfur out of the coal and keep it from going up the stack and heat and sulfur makes sulfur dioxide and sulfur dioxide and water makes sulfuric acid and this is this is not light, but uh, they're blaming their coal mine for all the climate change and everything else that they talk about. But I don't know. I've traveled along around quite a bit, and I see see the automobiles. When I go to city, you know, you can go to New York and Houston, Los Angeles. Millions of cars, and they're uh, they're spouting off tons, uh, ton upon ton more than what this mine is putting out. So I, I would like to see more research done to clean up coal, because coal is still the cheapest and the most stable source of electrical power that there is. And nobody seems to want to do anything about it except call coal black and get rid of it.
parents had always said, don't go in the mines. There's methane gas or coal gas, I guess they used to call it, in there, and it can kill you. So we we knew that. And for the most part, we stayed out of them. I had ventured in to the one that my uncles had run. And I went in a ways just to see what it was like, but never got past the oxygen supply. But sometimes people went further than they should. And I can remember a time when two teenage boys from this community went exploring in the mine that my uncles used to run. And um, eventually one guy passed out and his buddy came tearing to our farm. I remember the day he came and he said to my mom, where's Merle? There's a man dying in the mine. And he got my dad off a tractor and took him there. And I think they just had a little flashlight of some kind. And dad went in and he said he had to try and remember where did the tunnels go and which way did the shafts run. And from his best of memory, he said he'd been closed for 20, 20 some years. And he went in and found the, the, the fellow that was passed out, still passed out, but he said the ceiling had fell down in, in a place and there was a hump of dirt where the dirt had landed and it was probably five feet high. So when he fell on that elevated hump, there was still oxygen in the lower, in the higher part of the shaft and it saved his life. And so dad carried him out. He said he was a big boy and he, he said he, his lungs hurt for a week after getting that guy out of there, but it saved their lives. And, and we all learned a lesson. You don't win there. The community then said they need to stick some dynamite in there and bring that mine down so that nobody will do it again. My dad actually works at the coal mine over in Estevan and I was able to work as a summer student down at the mine sites. And I just remember, you know, during the summer times, uh, I was able to, to kind of get my first taste of the coal mine. So while, while my friends were working jobs at the malls and in restaurants, I was down in these big open pits and you could look up and you could see the, the, the earth pretty much exposed. You could see the coal seams and you could see all the different layers and you could just, it was just so different. Um, the equipment that's used here on site is huge. You have to have the, a level of respect too for the equipment that you're around. Yeah, South Block Mine just east of Cornac. It's out where Gus Brandeis is used to mine. I believe there was a Mickey's mine there too. But when the drag line uncovered the coal and the dozers would go down and clean it, you could see the mine shafts because the dozer tracks would actually break in to the coal. You could just see them indented. So then I was running loader at the time and we'd go down and take the seam out and under the high wall where none of the equipment had touched, the mine shafts were right there. And we don't go in them anymore, we can't because of safety and that's a good thing, but we used to go in and take a look and there was pottery, the rail tracks were there, the vents in the roof were there, there was actually engine blocks in the mines. I, I just wish then you were there with your camera and a light, we could have got some real interesting footage. <laughs> I guess... One of my favorite parts of, of the mining was Friday night when we're when we're off till Monday morning. Except some nights we'd renege on doing our shooting Friday night and leave it till Saturday morning, but at least we didn't have to work Friday night. <laughs> Usually there was a dance in some place on Friday night, so we'd Oh, a lot of times we didn't do our Friday shooting on Friday night, we did it Saturday morning.